yourself to know that I have a meaning and a purpose that I intend to convey to you tonight. We're going to have a moral to our story, and the moral to the story, I'm going to tell it to you right now, is pride is stupid. Family takes a lot more attention than, than you think it might be. And we're going to be talking about food, and we're going to be talking about my mother, who used to wear this scarf, so I thought I would bring her along, as long as I'm, so I wouldn't be talking behind her back. <laughs> This particular frying pan, I think, is coming up on a hundred years of age. I think it belonged to my great aunt. <clears throat> I got it from her when we were helping to clean out her trailer, my mother and I, after my great aunt had died. So she got married in the 20s, and this thing is coming up on a hundred years. Unless, of course, she got it from some other member of the family. So then it's like, who knows how old it is. It could be my mother's, and then it'd be only 50 years. but. We don't know that yet. The other thing about frying pans, not only are they heavy, cast iron frying pans, is that there's a reason home cooks love them. They hold heat well, they'll bring it up from the fire and into the pan and into whatever it is you're cooking. And it's really great to braise with, especially if you can get yourself a Dutch oven. And then the other reason, not only is this a, a piece of cookware that gets better with age, for us who are family cooks, this handle was held by our mother. This handle was held by our aunts and our grandmothers and our great cousins. We don't know how many other cooks of our family, the ones who cooked food for us, who nurtured us, who uh, taught us how to cook. Whenever I pull this pan out of the drawer, I'm holding hands with my mother. <coughs> Unfortunately, she wasn't a good cook. <laughs> Just to give you an example, um, every month, once a, one night a month, we would be served liver for dinner, which of course meant we all knew when she was having her period. Because um, there was a time, and you all may be spared from this, we had, women were thinking that they needed to eat iron-rich liver in order to recover whatever iron they might be losing out of their cycle. This isn't true, by the way. It's also a problem easily solved by vitamins, I'd like to point out. <laughs> Before my mother, it wasn't really her fault that she didn't know how to cook, is that um, in her time and place, you cooked all food to death. Well cooked everything. And if you've ever experienced liver cooked to shoe leather consistency. <laughs> And my mom, she started to realize I was suffering with this. So she's go, okay, we'll bake, make some bacon. I'm kind of wrap it around and I get two pieces of bacon and a piece of liver. And we go, there's not enough bacon in the world. Not enough. I finally did have liver um, cooked well at a Serbian uh, restaurant. So I, I know that it can actually be fed. Prior to that, it was kind of all about um, pate. I thought pate was a wonderful way to consume liver, but that was not yet in my mother's vocabulary of cooking. The other thing about, well, eventually my parents decided it was time for me to start cooking. And my mother is a school teacher. So I was taught how to make spaghetti. Go to the refrigerator, take out that pound of hamburger, put it into the frying pan, make brown it up, open up the cupboard, pull out a can of um, tomato sauce, pour it in, hunts. A um, little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, grab the green Parmesan cheese can shaker thingy, <laughs> and this was dinner. Bon appetit. Later on, I got a little cookbook out of my Girl Scout career, uh, American Girl cookbook, and they introduced the idea of canned mushrooms, which definitely, is, you know, it was a step up. <laughs> Dried oregano. Um, a little bit of uh, thyme. And then when I was coming out of college, a friend of mine introduced me to a food that changed my life. Fresh mushrooms cut up, sauteed in butter. <laughs> it was truly an amazing thing. But we're coming into the 80s, or coming into the 90s, which in the United States was a time when pretty much every middle class wannabe was busy also becoming a foodie. 
because Alice Walters had left San Francisco and gone for a walkabout in Europe where she discovered that there was more than iceberg lettuce in this world. <laughs> so she brought home a whole bunch of um, the seeds and we all dis together discovered uh, rocket greens, is what, uh, what's it called here, arugula? Arugula is rocket, that's it. Um, so everybody was learning how to cook. I was learning how to cook. My brother, who was also married and had children by this point in time, was learning how to cook. And we started competing against each other because what else do you do with your brother? <laughs> and um, we started taking over responsibility for the family holiday meals, like Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving. And we'd be busy working out who could throw down the best uh, fresh ham um, on the table. And we're talking not canned ham. I mean, we were, I grew up on ham and can. Um, we had graduated all the way up to getting fresh ham and then treating it and curing it and, I don't know, um, slicing and dicing. Uh, and my brother and I were just slamming it up against each other about how um, high cuisine we could go. Meanwhile, my mother would go, at first she was great, I'm not cooking dinner anymore, this is a good arrangement. And then she'd go, well what should I bring? Because we kind of did it Pollock style. And we kept turning to mom and going, carrot sticks, um, <laughs> celery sticks cut up. By the way, nothing in them. My mother had a lactase intolerance, so if she couldn't have milk, nobody's getting milk. <laughs> not even sour cream with Lipton dried soup in it to make it a dip. <laughs> And then, of course, the all-time favorite, um, little olives without their stones in a can that you could then put on your finger and go, Hi, I'm a person with an olive head. <laughs> and she, went, she was proud. She put it down on the table. And then we'd go, Thanks, Mom. That's really great. And oh, by the way, here's another set of appetizers. And it took her about two or three meals before she started figuring out that she was still taking home all of the redettes that she had brought. And she's not stupid. So she started watching what we were doing, and she was reading some of the magazines we were reading, and then one year she came and said, I want to host a dinner. I'm going, my brother and I were both going, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this went on for a couple more years, and then she finally called us all up and said, you are coming to my house next week at 7 o'clock. Okay, I'm going, um, okay. Uh, that sounds like marching orders. Now the running joke about going to mom's house for dinner was, do you go to McDonald's ahead of time, or do you go to McDonald's afterwards? <laughs> so we walk on in, and we're looking at the table, and it's fine napkins, or I mean, pipe, no paper on the table, you know, cloth napkins, cloth tablecloth, um, all of the forks and knives you're supposed to have at one of these things. And then she started bringing out the food, and we're like, going, wait, what? When did you learn how to cook? It was incredibly great food. It was very delicious. It was like we were licking our plates delicious. And we were saying, Mom, this is incredible. This is absolutely wonderful. And she just sort of sat back in her chair and just kind of got this little grin on her face and never cooked for us again. <laughs> now, I always love this story about my mom because I kind of like, I kind, she's kind of badass to do that, you know? <laughs> to bring us all in and show off, hey, I actually do know how to cook, you losers. <laughs> and then I'm not doing this game any longer. And so for a long time I used to tell the story, and that was the moral of the story, is, you know, don't um, misjudge your parents' ability to change. But I, I was getting ready for telling this story tonight, and I came up with another moral um, that kind of I, I want to tell you about, which is this. That was almost the last meal we had together as a whole family. My dad died not too long after that. My husband left me. We had a few Christmases in there where you know, we were all just staring at each other because the shocks were just so high. And then eventually she sort of wandered off the Alzheimer's trail, so she wasn't cooking anything. Meanwhile, my brother was dealing this by kind of withdrawing and going with his other, the family on the other side of his family, so he wasn't really showing up for the meals either. That meal really was my mother's last meal. And for me, as I was thinking about this, I'm 60 now, and I'm thinking about what did we do wrong here? Cut our mother out of the table. We cut her out of the kitchen. My brother and I chose to believe that my mother could not change, and so we would not let her come to the table as one of us. We cut each other out of our lives. 
because we're so busy competing over the best way to brine a turkey, that we lost <clears throat> 10 years of pretty much our entire adult family lifetime. We lost the opportunity to be a family at the table together. And that's why I'm trying to tell you pride is stupid. Mic drops are a waste of your time. If you're an adult child and you think your parents are useless and cannot change, take another look and trust them. Because if my brother and I had gone to my mother and said, you know what, you credits suck canal water. And here's a fairly simple project that might involve, I don't know, browning mushrooms and butter. And it would be yum yum. But we, didn't, we chose not to do that. So we lost 10 years of cooking together creatively.